thanks for inviting me. Um, this is great. It's, it's, it's one, of, one of the good things and bad things about being able to do things virtually is you can actually um, get to reach out more, um, but at the same time, you don't actually get to um, meet people in person, which is a bit of a shame. But um, I'm just going to start off with a disclosure. It's probably more of a confession that I'm not a bioinformatician or computational biologist or even a programmer. I'm biochemist, cell biologist, developmental biologist. So um, this group's a little bit intimidating to me because I'm not the person who actually knows all about the computational um, aspects. Um, but it's really important, especially in, I think, <laughs> topics like developmental biology, um, where it's really made a big difference to the um, what we can learn about developmental biology. Developmental biology was really made for genomics and single cell analysis. So I'm going to start off, I'm going to talk about both um, our heart valve work and our liver work. Um, so hopefully this isn't a little bit too much, but um, I wanted to talk about our liver stuff, which I think um, is a little bit uh, more solidified and also our current work on what we're doing with heart valves. So, um, so I'll start off with the liver. And so the liver is, uh, in a, it, it's, it's not the most attractive organ. So I think that people don't necessarily think of liver when they think of working on something, but it's, it's an incredibly important organ and it's essential for homeostasis and it's responsible for over 500 functions, and all these are vital, like glycogen storage, di uh, digestive enzymes, plasma protein synthesis, like albumin and clotting factors, um, xenobiotic um, metabolism, and recycling of red blood cells. It just does a whole host of different things. Um, the liver is highly regenerative. Um, so you can actually, it's the only organ you can really do this. You can remove two thirds of the liver um, from a mouse or a human and it will actually regrow in about 30 days. So it's actually regenerative. So it's, it's an amazing organ that way. Um, so things like viruses, um, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, xenobi uh, xenobiotic toxicity, alcohol toxicity, fatty, uh, liver, fatty acid liver disease, they're all um, disorders which can lead to um, um, chronic hepatocyte loss and damage. And if you get these, uh, um, it happening in a chronic state, then liver disease will eventually lead to cirrhosis and also to uh, can it re lead to liver cancer. So it's very serious because once it gets to the point where it's cirrhotic, we don't know how to fix it. The liver is essential. If your liver fails, um, it's pretty serious. Um, luckily it doesn't happen very often, but if it does, it, it, it's very serious. So if you get end-stage liver disease, the only solution is a liver transplant. And in order, um, obviously, uh, getting liver transplants is a, 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 a shortage. There's a shortage of, of donors. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of work that's being done to try and um, understand how um, um, uh, the hepatic, uh, sorry, pluripotent stem cells can also contribute to this. So um, I'm not going to talk about pluripotent stem cells today, though. So. So here's just a, a sort of a structure of the liver. So even though the liver is, as I said, a kind of an ugly organ, um, it's got this really elegant um, ultra structure. So here's just sort of a diagram of the liver. So the liver is made up of these sort of hexagonal components, which are called lobules. And then these, um, each one of these lobules, this, at each of the vertices, there's what they call the, 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 tri, the triportal that... Um, so there's the, the three vessels, basically. So there's the bile duct, the hepatic artery, and the portal vein. And so this is sort of a blow up here. So you have the bile duct, the, the portal vein, and the hepatic artery. It's called the portal triad. That's the word I was trying to think of earlier. I'm not sure why I couldn't remember it. And these, uh, basically, the portal vein and the hepatic artery, they bring the blood into the liver, and that gets dumped into the central vein. And it's worth noting that both oxygenated and deoxygenated blood are mixed here. And the blood actually uh, passes through um, the sinusoidal endothelial. So these sinusoidal endothelial, called hepatic sinusoidal endothelial cells, they're, they're unique in that they actually have gaps. There's actually holes. It's fenestrated. And that allows the blood to really contact with the hepatocytes. The hepatocytes themselves, which is the major functional cell of the liver, they actually line these, these endothelial um, 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 hepatic sinusoids cells and, and in these epithelial sheets. So you can see these epithelial sheets. 
And then on the, um, the basal side of the uh, hepatocyte um, is where there's the bile caniculi. So the, the hepatocytes are making bile and dumping it into those caniculi and that goes down to the bile duct and then that takes the bile to the gallbladder. Um, so these cells that are lining the gallbladder are called cholangiocytes. Um, some of the other cells of interest are these Kupfer cells. These are um, um, immune cells. So these resident macrophages and the stellate cells. So these stellate cells are these um, resident um, fibroblast cells that are found in the liver, which are thought to be involved in things like regeneration and repair. So this, it's quite a, an interesting ultrastructure, but despite that, we, kn we know very little about how that actually forms. Um, um, and so my lab has been interested in um, the early liver stages of early stages of liver development and the liver uh, um, buds basically out of that, that very early endoderm. And so this is just a schematic at eight and a half days where you've got, this is the gut tube here. And on the ventral side of the gut tube, you start to see a thickening of the endodermal cells. Again, this is an, endo, an epithelial sheet of cells. And you can see that surrounded by these um, uh, endothelial cells here. And this gray, gray represents the mesenchyme, which is surrounding it, which we call the septum transversum. So by about E9.5, you start to see these um, hepatoblasts as they're called at this stage. Um, delaminate from the gut tube and migrate into the mesoderm. And so that continues on to 10 and a half. And about 10 and a half, you start to get ingression of the hematopoietic cells. And so the liver starts to look really red by this point. Um, but you've got, so again, you've got these hepatoblasts and those hepatoblasts are gonna eventually differentiate into cholangiocytes and hepatocytes. You've got the endothelial cells, which are scattered throughout. Sorry, let me just put that on the endothelial cells, which are scattered throughout, and um, you've got the mesodermal cells, which are also integrated in there. So you've got four major cell types, really. So we were really interested. Oops, sorry, I forgot. Um, these are just some pictures of what it really looks like. So the green cells here, which are labeled by GFP, um, those are those hepatoblasts. They're bipotent cells that are going to become cholangiocytes and hepatocytes. Alcam, this is the mesoderm here, and you can see in red, you can see the endothelial cells. And at 10 and a half, you can see how it's much more uh, mixed and integrated with some mesoderm around the outside. So we were really interested in uh, some very basic questions. Um, how heterogeneous is the early liver? And we could we better define the early lineage specification steps, including both the mesenchyme, the endothelium, as well as the hepatic lineages. We were also interested in who's talking to who during development um, and what the signals are. And um, we were also interested in transcription factors that are driving these different hepatic lineages. So at that point, we were able to get involved with a, um, a, a group in uh, New York. So Kat Jantanakis and I, we'd approached uh, uh, 10X Genomics to set up this kind of big experiment actually. Um, and it was to really map endoderm from the very early blastocyst stage all the way through early um, mouse embryogenesis and through to the early stages of organogenesis. So Kat um, was really interested in these early stages and we were interested in, in the uh, organogenesis stages. And the only reason I show you this is because some of the, the libraries overlap. So for example, the, the definitive endoderm library here uh, we used and we had some gut tube libraries um, uh, from eight and a half, and we're using those too. So in our project, focusing on the liver, we use the seven and a half, eight and a half, and then we dissected nine and a half whole liver. We just took the little liver bud and just took it right out. And at 10 and a half, we had a little bit of trouble because of the hematopoietic cells. So we actually had to do fact sorting to isolate the cells. So we use uh, GFP positive uh, mouse uh, with AFP, GFP, mouse positive mouse to isolate the hepato. The, uh, the hepatoblast lineage. And then we took the GFP minus cells and we depleted them for the blood cells. And we called that our, uh, and that contained a larger proportion of mesenchyme and endothelial cells. So we put all those libraries together. And um, this just here, this graph here, just gives the proportions of the different cell types at each stage. So for example, at uh, E9.5, and I lost the key. <laughs> Sorry, the key disappeared. Oh no, it's right there. Sorry. Um, 
the endoderm cells here are, are 27%, mesoderm 45%, at 10 and a half, uh, mesoderms 50%, and our endoderm cells, our hepatic lineages were 21%. So it, it helped enrich a lot for those cells. Um, we did the usual, we put the cells all together, we clustered them, we got our clusters, and then we identified our clusters um, based on marker genes. Um, but since that was a little bit overwhelming, oh shoot. So sorry, these were just, this is just to show uh, our marker genes that we used to, some of the marker genes, the top marker genes used to generate our clusters, but it was too overwhelming. So we actually separated into three separate clusters, se separate groups. So mesenchymal clusters, the endothelial clusters and the hepatoblasts. So I'm gonna first talk about the endothelial clusters quickly, just to give you an idea of how we actually approach our, our questions. Um, so, Again, since this is a bioinformatics group, I thought I'd let you know a little bit more about the, the, what we actually do. Um, so because it was a collaboration um, with Dana Pear's lab with the original project, um, we used a lot of her um, uh, tools that she had developed. And so the sequencing reads were aligned and quantified using Cell Ranger from 10X Genomics. We used Harmony, um, which is used, was used for bat, batch correction as well as force directed layouts. We use phenograph for our actual cluster formation. Um, we did use Surat for our differential gene expression. And then we used Palantir, which was um, developed by Manny, Manny Setu to, uh, for our differentiation trajectory analysis and pseudo time progression. So, um, Uh, so this is the, so basically I'm going to start with the, the sinusoidal cells. So the sinusoidal cells, as I, I mentioned at the beginning, they, they, that, that you get this hepatic sinusoidal endothelium and it's different than regular endothelium because it's fenestrated. It's got these holes in it, which allow the contact um, of the blood with hepatocytes. And so um, you can see this is our time points showing our different time points. So the seven and a half is over here. And we also included some hematopoietic cells just to sort of drag um, so that we could um, pull the hematopoietic cells away from our endothelial lineage. Um, so the endothelial cells, they begin with a hemangioblast and we can actually see the hemangioblast here. This is just gene expression where the size is the percent of cells expressing that gene. And then the color is the uh, scale of expression. Um, but we can see these hemangioblasts and then we can see this, what we call typical endothelium. So these are endothelium, uh, which is uh, more like regular blood vessel endothelium. Um, and then we can see these hepatic sinusoidal endothelial cells coming out here. And um, what, how we can tell them is they've got some very specific markers like STAB2 here and LI1 here. So you can actually see that these are hepatic endothelial cells. They're not just regular endothelial cells. So we actually even by doing uh, it, this sort of um, pulling out and then reclustering our data, we were able to really identify unique gene expression patterns by these early hepatocyte and endothelial cells. So um, I don't know why sometimes it does. So this is just, again, our next step then is to just do pseudo time. Um, again, as I said, this is using Palantir. And so you can see that there is here, there's a point here, which is our hepatic sinusoidal endothelial cells and here, which is our endothelial, regular endothelial cells. Entropy just uh, measures a little bit of the plasticity of the cells. So obviously cells at the beginning are much more plastic. They become less plastic. And we see another um, uh, um, uh, a, a low in the, or uh, high in the plasticity um, right here between our, our regular endothelial and our hepatic sinusoidal endothelial. Um, these are just uh, pseudo time trajectories of our, our gene expression pattern. And as you can see, both the, uh, from the hepatic sinusoidal endothelial versus the endothelial, you can see that the, um, these three factors are fairly the same, the HX, the EBT, ETB2, and KDR. But in the, um, I keep moving the uh, picture, <laughs> the picture that, that everybody is gonna get rid of that. There we go, that's much better. Um, 
But in the in the hepatic sinusoidal endothelial cells there, we can see the STAB2 and the LIV1 that's coming out here, whereas in the endothelium, we see things like CLIF2 and KLF4. So these are transcription factors which respond to flow. Um, in contrast, we, in, our, in our hepatic sinusoidal endothelial cells, we see things like DLL4, which is an indication of, of, of not signaling. Um, what we do see, this, this here is just a trajectory of the hepatic sinusoidal endothelial as they, as they come out. And we can actually see that some of these dots here, there's not very many, but you can see some of them as early as E8.75. So it's, it's really much, much earlier than we previously appreciated that you're starting to get this differentiation into these sinusoidal endothelial cells. So we did basically, I won't go through it quite, I'll, I'll go through it a bit quicker um, now. We basically did the exact same thing, the exact same strategy as I just showed you there with our um, hepatoblasts, her, our hepatic lineages. So again, we see these early cells at E8.75, um, and they move towards this um, he uh, hepatoblast here. And if we cluster, we can see that there's endoderm. These are sort of more definitive endoderm-like cells. We see what we call these migrating hepatoblasts, and then we see this hepatoblast culture uh, uh, cluster here. What was probably the most surprising to us was we saw this cluster up here, which appeared to be a set of cells which were, we called them hepatomesenchyme because they, they come from the hepato, the endodermal hepatoblast lineage, but they seem to uh, get developed mesenchymal um, gene expression patterns. So that's just shown down here. Here's our endoderm. Um, Here's our hepatoblast markers. You start to see, um, we call them migrating hepatoblasts because they're, uh, they're expressing PROX1, TBX3, 1, CUP1. And then we see our, um, our, our more mature hepatoblasts, which are expressing higher levels of FOXA3. There's HNF4. So the transcription factors, which are uh, master regulators of uh, hepatic, uh, hepatoblast lineage. There's, there's alpha feta protein here albumin here. And so these were really the, the hepatoblasts. This here is our hepatomesenchymal re, uh, lineage. And you can see that they have lower levels of this alpha feta protein or albumin, um, DLK1, um, but they're also turning on things like PDGFR alpha and HAN2 and GATA4 actually. Um, and so they, they, are, uh, they do have this sort of hybrid type of phenotype to them. Um, this is the trajectory analysis. So we were able to show like endoderm and it uh, will either go towards the hepatoblast lineage or the hepatomesenchymal lineage and um, the pseudotime and differentiation potential down here. And this is just some gene expression patterns to convince you that it's real. Um, as you can see here, here's FOXA3, which is really nicely expressed, DLK1 in those differentiated hepatoblasts. And here's the mentin. PDGFR alpha, which is expressed in those hepatomesenchymal cells. Um, again, pseudo time trajectory shows us exactly the same thing. I think one of the interesting things is you can see that, uh, so this is the endoderm in the middle, hepatoblasts on the left, hepatomesenchymal cells on the right. And you can see that cells like uh, that expression of, I'll start over here, that albumin, HNF4 alpha, alpha feta protein, all of these really key liver. Um, Genes are very highly expressed over here in hepatoblasts. And, and, and then over on a hepatomesenchymal cells, you can see the albumin's turned on, the AFP's turned on, and HNF4 is turned on, but then it starts to get turned off. And we see things like snail one, um, CDH2, ZEB2, snail two turning on Alcam, all of these um, genes which are sort of more uh, associated with mesenchyme. And again, so we do, we do a lot of this. I'm just gonna show you quickly one. This is uh, just to show you that, um, so the, again, the GFP is the hepatoblast. Vimentin here is a, a marker, sort of mesenchymal marker here. Um, and you can see that these are co-expressed. So there are cells in there. Not all of the cells are of course co-expressing, but you can identify these cells that are co-expressing. So one of we've postulated, um, I, we don't really know what these cells are, these hepatomesenchymal cells. Uh, one possibility that we think they could be leader cells in collective cell migration. And since the hepatoblasts migrate as cords, perhaps those migrating hepatoblasts, and then this this, this, this um, leader cell at the end. Um, 
And we really have no idea currently where they end up. Do they revert back to hepatoblast uh, lineage or do they convert completely to the mesenchymal lineage? And we don't know that. So last lineage, what about the mesenchyme? Um, so we did the exact same thing here um, that, that um, we've done, uh, did previously. So we clustered our mesenchyme. We see four, uh, five different clusters here. Um, this, um, sorry, here, our, this is our septum transversa me mesenchyme. So this is uh, more of our 8.75 cells. Um, we see another septum transversa mesenchyme. We see these hepatic stellate cells. So those hepatic stellate cells are the ones I mentioned at the beginning where they're the, the fibroblasts, the hepatic uh, fibroblasts, the resident fibroblasts. And we see two lineages of mesothelium. So mesothelium are the, is, the, is the cell type which surrounds the organs and so that they don't, organs don't stick together in the body. That would be kind of bad. So mesothelium is, is that um, lineage which surrounds the entire liver. Um, and again, we see very distinct expressions. I'm not going to uh, go through them uh, as specifically. I point out GATA4, since the GATA is a really um, big one in our previous talk. But the, um, but I think that the, the main point of this slide is that the, les, liver, the liver mesenchymal lineages, there you already see this differentiation of mesenchymal lineages happening before E10.5, and that we see these stellate cells present very, very early in these liver buds. So one of the things I haven't shown you, oh, this is just, sorry, this is just, I'll go through this quickly. This is just to prove that there are different lineages. So um, Islet one is back here. It's in our mesothelial two and SOX nine is in our mesothelial one. Um, and you can see here that they are actually labeling different populations. This is, that was really the point of this slide is to show that they're labeling uh, different populations at 9.5. Um, this is more at 10.5 and you can see this is the 10.5 liver across here. And this is just sections from the different regions of the liver. And you can see in one and two, there's very little islet expression. Whereas in region three, we have the islet one expression where SOX9 um, is very distinct from that islet one expression. Um, the outcomes just to mark the sort of more mesenchymal lineages. And the, I should add the GFP of course is marking our hepatoblasts. Um, and this is just a marker, DES is just a marker of those hepatic stellate cells. Um, and so you can see that, yes, these hepatic stellate cells are uh, present even in these E10.5 livers. So one of the things that I was really interested in, this is why I showed you the mesenchyme, um, is that we were unable to decipher a trajectory of differentiation in our mesenchymal populations. And at first, my student was very... Um, upset, I guess, that he couldn't seem to find a trajectory in the mesenchymal cells. And I was actually thrilled by that because one of the things as a biologist is I'm always worried about this black box, putting data in and what comes out the end and does it actually mean anything? And the fact that it couldn't find a trajectory made complete sense to me um, and actually made me quite happy. Um, and because this really suggests that our mesenchymal populations are not directly related at this stage, and that probably there's a common precursor, which is much earlier than the stages that we included in our analysis. So the fact that they weren't able to force a trajectory um, shows that they are distinct populations. And so, as I mentioned before, we use our Harmony for our batch correction and Palantir for trajectory analysis. We initially had done this with Monocle 2 but we found that monocle two actually can force a trajectory when one isn't necessarily there. Um, and though I have, I have my, my student says, and I haven't got the data here to show that monocle three is better, um, but it's just something to be aware of. You don't want necessarily to have these trajectories there if they're not real. So we are very interested in who's talking to who in the liver bud. And so for that, um, We've been uh, using cell phone DB. So cell phone DB, um, probably uh, some of you might be aware of this algorithm. It seems to be the popular one right now for looking at cell-cell interaction. Um, and we use this to actually look specifically at the signaling niche within the early sinusoid at E10.5, because 
Otherwise, it's just way too much data. Um, why we like cell phone DB is it's basically a repository of receptor ligand pairs, um, but it also takes into account whether there's complexes that are necessary. So subunit complex is necessary for the signaling um, to happen. Um, and so we can run. So we actually ran our data through cell phone DB. And this is just obviously a portion of the data, but it was quite interesting in that we could see these paracrine factors. Um, I should actually point out, I guess, a little bit that in red here, we have our ligands. So that's our signaling cell. And in blue, we have our receptors um, and that's our receiving cells. So here we have our receiving cells and here we have our signaling cells, our sender cells. Um, but we were able to identify paracrine factors such as PDGF um, alpha, um, signaling and BMP signaling. This is perhaps not so surprising because we know that PD, uh, BMPs are important in hepatic development. Um, we also saw DLK1 signaling, uh, sorry, not DLK1, notch signaling. Um, here we have um, DLK. So interestingly, DLK1 is thought to be a negative inhibitor while DLL4 is a positive in, um, activator. But we also saw efferin signaling um, and relin signaling, which very little is known about in the liver. So this is really interesting. And we also saw factors that are meeting in cell cell adhesion. So you can get a lot of different information. And of course, every single one of these lines is an experiment in itself. So I'm not going to go further. We have been continuing on with our cell phone DB analysis. Um, I two things that we had to do is we had to add quite a lot of receptor ligand pairs to the data because many are missing. And the other thing that we did is in order to develop this so that we have ligand and receptors, as well as senders and receiver populations, we actually had to go in and manually reorganize the data because one of the problems with cell phone DB is that the receptors and ligands are kind of randomly um, entered into the database. Uh, the only thing I wanted to just sort of point out, um, we've been going on and looking at nine and a half and adding in blood cells as well into our analysis. But one of the things that uh, I was particularly interested in, I told my student, okay, I wanna know, I, I'm interested in the hepatoblasts and how they're developing. So I wanna know who's signaling to the hepatoblasts. And the interesting thing was that she, uh, doing this analysis, and this is just a small component of the analysis, but she found that there was very few signals going to the hepatoblasts, and there was a lot more that went to the hepatocyte sinusoidal endothelial cells and the hepatic stellate cells. And so it looks like in the liver that we're getting more signaling from those hepatoblasts to these other cells than we are from these cells to the hepatoblasts. Um, I just want to show a quick couple of examples. Um, one is the um, BMP2, which is there. It, this has actually been reclustered, but it's in the sinusoidal endothelial cells and not in, um, in the mesenchyme or the hepatoblasts. And uh, here's the receptors. So you can see the receptors are quite low in the sinusoidal endothelial cells, particularly the type 1 receptor, the BMP type 1 receptor, whereas it's, they're both the, the type 2 and the type 1 receptors are present in the um, in, in the mesenchyme and the, and the hepatoblasts. BMP7, uh, another ligand, sorry, is, is there in the hepatoblasts. So the whole point of this is it really allows us to begin to look not just at BMP signaling in general, but the real specific ligands and receptors of who's talking to who and, and where they're actually um, potentially located. So I'll skip over that one. So this is just sort of a summary of the liver. Um, and basically we showed that there's uncharacterized diversity within liver mesenchyme. Um, we saw the early emergence of the stellate cells and the sinusoidal endothelial cells. Um, we were able to identify a novel migratory hepatic cell, uh, cell type, this hepatomesenchymal cells, and we were able to characterize some of the uh, sinusoidal niche. So I hope uh, we have time for to go quickly through um, the heart valve. I, 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 if I'd realized there was a heart talk before my talk, I might've put more of the heart stuff in, sorry about this. But anyway, um, we, we've also been interested in heart valve formation and this is what we're currently working on. Um, and this is just a, uh, a quick schematic of, so this, as, as, as was mentioned, um, the heart actually starts off as a tube and there's really 
only two types of cells. So you've got this cardiac mesenchyma on the outside and you've got these endocardial or endothelial, which are specific to the cardiac um, tissue on the inside. And that's separated by just extracellular matrix called cardiac jelly. And this is the atria down here. This is ventricle up here. At this stage, it's upside down. And there's this little constriction here. And that's where the cart valves are gonna form, which uh, go from the right ventricle to the left ventricle and the, um, sorry, the right, the right atria to the right ventricle and the left atria to the left ventricle. Um, so these valves, they actually form by a process of epithelial or endothelial to mesenchymal transformation. Um, and so what happens there is in this region where you get this pinching, where you get that little pinch there, you start to form what's called cardiac cushions. And then cells from the endothelial, the endocardial cells, the endothelial cells, I'm sorry, I'm going back and forth a little bit in nomenclature, but the endocardial cells here undergo an EMT process, so an epithelial to mesenchymal transformation, and they migrate into these cushions to populate these cushions. And you can actually see it down here. Here's, here's an actual picture rather than schematic. So here is that cushion, and that cushion is lined by endothelial cells. And these green cells, which are labeled by SOX9, are undergoing EMT and migrating into these cushions. Um, a little bit later, a day later, you can see that the cushion here, again, it's lined by these endothelial cells, and the cushion itself um, is, is completely filled now with these SOX9 positive cells. There's uh, a second wave, which is called epicardial um, to mesenchymal transition, which occurs and which forms these lateral leaflets here. Um, again, this is the main leaflet, and you can see these SOX9 positive cells. But here, here, and I'm just showing here, so you can start to see how these cells are actually forming valves. So this leaflet here is forming one of the leaflets of this valve over here, and, and the center region is forming the other leaflet. So this is a valve which is going from uh, the right atria to the right ventricle, and over here is another pair of leaves which are going from the left atria to the left ventricle. So the real problem is that the embryonic mouse heart, maybe not as small as the uh, zebrafish heart, but it's very small and the valves are even smaller. So, and, but they still have these multiple cell types. And so this seemed to us be an ideal system for single cell analysis. Um, and so we did that. Um, we actually generated cell, uh, we actually dissected out that pinched region, that atrioventricular canal region, um, at 10 and a half and 12 and a half. And we uh, did single cell RNA-seq on that. And we integrated that with some seven and a half, eight and a half, and nine and a half whole heart mouse data from the Soisa et al. Um, so for this talk, I'm gonna specifically focus on the endothelial to mesenchymal transformation in the heart valves. So we extracted, same thing before, we extracted specifically the cells that are involved in that process. So we extracted those endocardial to mesenchymal lineages. Same sort of thing, we can go on and cluster, and we can actually see in the cluster, there's the tra trajectory over here. Um, you can see that there's endothelial cells here, those are those very early cells, moving the, they, those endothelial cells now become more specific to the endocardium, then even more specific to the atrioventricular endocardium. And then from there, they can migrate into, uh, become mesenchyme. So we've got some early AV mesenchyme and then the later AV mesenchyme, or into the valve endothelial cells, which are actually gonna coat the, the, the valves, which are gonna encompass the valves. And we can actually look at the gene expression profiles that we see. So here, here's our endothelial cells, which have got the, the tech, uh, the TI2 or the tech, um, CDH5, which is VE cadherin, TI1 and PCAM, very highly expressed. And over here, we've got our mesenchymal lineages, our early lineage, as well as our later lineages here. The main difference between the two later lineages is the um, proliferation markers that we can see here. You can see aurora kinase and M MKI67 uh, are expressed in, in, in the, our proliferating mesenchymal lineage here. So we, could, we, we generated a mesenchyme um, signature 
gene expression signature and endothelial gene expression signature. And you can see, and, and these are now uh, labeled um, in, for, on our time point. So from seven and a half, eight and a half, uh, 9.25, 10.5, 12.5. And you can see in those early lineages, they're very endothelial, there's very little mesenchyme um, signature in those cells. At, at about E10.5, uh, we can see that there's this, uh, there's this group of cells which has both the uh, mesenchymal as well as those endothelial signatures as they transition from the endothelial to the mesenchyme. So these are the plastic cells. Um, we call them EMPs, but these are endothelial mesenchymal plastic cells. And then we can see that there's a mesenchymal um, um, uh, signature, which becomes more and more prominent in those in, in, in the more differentiated cells. At uh, 12 and a half, you can see that the lineages are much more distinct. We've got an endothelial lineage and a mesenchymal lineage. So the whole point of showing you this was to show you our mutant data. So we actually used a mouse model where we deleted SOX9 conditionally in the atrioventricular cushions. And this was done using a TIE 2 CRE with a floxed SOX9. And so just to remind you, so if TI2 Cree is expressed in those endocardial lineages and that these mesenchymal cells are going to be uh, derived from those endocardial lineages, that means SOX9 is going to be knocked out in the endocardium and it's going to also be knocked out in those um, cells which are populating the cushions. So again, we dissected the atrioventricular canal and we, um, this is just at 10 and a half I'm showing you now. And so we have our wild type um, litter mates as well as our conditional knockouts. And I think the most interesting thing you can see just briefly is if we look at our, our clusters, so we've got, this is the early mesenchyme cells. These are those, um, those, those VEX, the valve endothelial cells, which we think have, uh, the, the, uh, have the plasticity, the endothelial mesenchymal plasticity. And here is the, um, um, the endocardial, those AV endocardial cells. And what you can see between the wild type and the SOX9 is that there's fewer of these mesenchymal cells. There's a great expansion of these um, plastic cells, these, these endothelial mesenchymal uh, plasticity cells. And there's also an expansion of the endocardium. So what this really seems to suggest is that, that the SOX9, if you delete SOX9, you're actually really... Um, you're, you're, you're delaying that differentiation or in fact, completely blocking that, uh, potentially blocking that differentiation. Over here, there's just some of those uh, entropy maps which show the plasticity and in the wild type, you can see that you see a lot loss of plasticity as you move towards the mesenchyme lineages. Whereas in the SOX9 knockout, we see much, many fewer cells and much, uh, we don't see that same, um, uh, loss of plasticity. We do with the valve um, cells. So this again is just to show you a little bit more about the gene expression patterns to convince you that they are different. Um, so you can see here wild type versus knockout. So something like CLIF1 is much higher in the wild type than in the knockout called 9A3, um, whereas SOX5 um, sorry, SOX5 is also higher in the wild type than in the knockout, whereas um, things like SNAIL1, sorry, SNAIL1 and um, FLRT2 are higher in our, our knockout. So you can actually see this here more in, in a heat map version. So the, we don't see much difference in the AV endocardial cells. In our, in our uh, progenitor cells, we start to see some upregulation of some factors, but there's not a huge difference. But when we when they actually have transformed into that mesenchyme, there's a huge difference in the gene expression patterns with the, the wild type um, expressing a lot of these normal mesenchymal markers, whereas the, the knockout cells, they're, ex they're expressing a lot of the like twist one, they're seeing a major upregulation, sorry, in things like twist one and snail one and MSX2, as if it's trying to compensate for the loss of SOX9. So these are transcription factors, which are master regulators of those EMT processes, and they're massively upregulated in our SOX9 cells. So, sorry, that was a little bit long, but um, 
we just wanted to summarize that we've been able to map the trajectory of cells moving from endothelial to mesenchymal fates in the um, heart valves. Um, and I, I didn't show it, but we've got a whole bunch of immunofluorescent microscopy data to validate it. Um, when SOX9 is conditionally deleted, the cells seem to be delayed in differentiation. Um, endothelial cells are similar, but we see an expansion in those early plastic states, and we see an upregulation of mesenchymal master regulators. Um, previously, I just wanted to point out, we have done SOX9 deleted heart valve experiment on bulk RNA-seq and dissected from dissected atrioventricular canals, but we didn't get anywhere near the amount of information as we got from this single cell analysis. So these are the people. Um, Jeremy Lotto has done a lot of this work, Sybil Drizzler. She's our uh, computer expert. She does uh, helps a lot with all of our analysis. Tabby as well, um, and, and with the methods that development um, way, Becky and Bettina. And as I mentioned, sorry, earlier, this was a collaboration with 10X Genomics and with Memorial Sloan Kettering with Katja Gentinakis.